For months, you've been hiding from your parents the extent you went to in order to communicate with notorious serial killers. You went back and forth writing to them, but with one of them, letters turned to calls, and then calls turned to visits. Now the rapport has been built, you realize your manipulation might have backfired. You used your imagination in order to get these serial killers to write back to you, but now one of them is holding your lies against you. So you decide to sit your parents down and finally tell them the whole truth. This is the story of Jason Moss. I don't want to be the overpromiser, but once this channel is monetized, all of this money is going to go towards true crime books. Because I have discovered a niche. You cannot describe the pleasure that it gives me to devour the whole book within a day and then sit here and tell you the story of it. I have a couple of them lined up and it's just the perfection of a true crime book once you finish reading it and you don't have to do any other research. Like, every single question you had is answered within that book. That's when you know you have found, you have found the right book. There's so many good ones out there. Also, speaking of book recommendations, this is already all over the place, this intro, I'm looking to research based on other people's recommendations the case of Charles Ng and Leonard Lake. So, I need a really good book on that case. I discovered that there are a couple of them online, but I wondered if you ever read a book on that case. Can you, like, drop down in the comments which one is better or, you know, which articles maybe I should read to really understand the dynamic of that duo, of the serial killer duo that committed a lot of sex crimes. Now that you said that all in one breath, another passion in mind that will become relevant in this video that is a really long one, so I need to keep this intro short, is ABC's 2020. You guys probably know it by this point, because I used it for Melanie McGuire case, I used it on the podcast for Dahlia DiPolito episode. This is like... You know how people... The ABC's 2020, what they do for me is that thing that people resort to reality shows for. Like, okay, I'm not gonna lie, I like me a good reality show to, to have a break from true crime as well. But it's the way these 2020s are done is just this over-the-top sensationalized coverage of a true crime case that keeps you so glued to it. And, well, for this one, I discovered that they have been doing this for, like, decades. Because the coverage you'll be seeing for today's video is from like 80s or 90s and they interviewed Jason Moss for it, that's why I'm gonna be playing it. And it still has that trustworthy ABC 2020 sense to it. Every, literally, you lost everybody but at this point. They like skipped through the max timestamp in the video. Any other ABC 2020 fans? Okay, now that you got that out of your system. Hello, Maya is the name. <laughs> and people who have went too far is the game. It is the theme of this month. And two weeks ago, we spoke about a couple that wrote to serial killers. Now, at the end of that video, I might have said that I didn't fully buy that story. Like, I don't know how trustworthy it is because of the lack of psychological effects, because of the fact that it didn't really affect their mental health as much as you would expect for a couple that is writing to serial killers for about 20 years. That is not the case of the person we're talking about today, and that is exactly why I like this book. I'll keep my thoughts about this book for the end of this video, but I feel like this book will definitely offer the answers to all of those questions about why would somebody start something like this, what kind of things they would be looking into, what kind of research they would do in order to communicate with the serial killers, in order to get something out of them, and in the end, what happens in the end? Do you get anything out of it? And this one has a bit of a shocker in the end, so if you're familiar with this case, you know exactly what I'm on about. Disclaimer on this one, it won't get super graphic. I'm just gonna briefly mention sort of like what these serial killers that Jason communicated with have done, just to give you the context, otherwise it wouldn't make much sense. But it gets really dark. By the end, you kind of feel like this story has taken some toll on your own mental health, just by reading this book or listening to this case. So, 
maybe just split this video into a couple of parts. Just say, just take care of yourself. I won't be offended if this is not the one that you watch until the very end. I might put something lighter in the description box for you. And now, let's just dive in, because this might be the longest one yet. So, Jason Moss, the last victim. Our story today begins with an honors thesis presentation, where Jason invited his teacher, and his teacher kind of got a feeling that this will be something super boring, as it usually is, with only a couple of people attending. But once he showed up, he realized that the gossip apparently spread around that this will be something extraordinary, something really weird, something a student hasn't done before. In this presentation, Jason began saying, I will be talking about accessing the minds of various serial killers from the perspective of their victims. We really know very little about how they manage to overpower people, manipulate and degrade them, get them to do things they wouldn't otherwise consider, he continued. He then went on to talk about how in his freshman year at college, instead of going to parties, instead of enjoying his time there, making friends, he spent a lot of time in his room researching these serial killers. But perhaps what the audience was most surprised with is when Jason meant that in one case he was actually able to experience firsthand what it felt like to be stalked, seduced, manipulated, and trapped by a deranged murderer who killed more than 30 times before. After this presentation, Jason spoke to his teacher, and his teacher was really surprised. He said, like, okay, I really didn't expect this, but you know what? Like, I feel like you need to write a book. You played some calls, you read some letters during this presentation. All of that material can be put together in one book. And the focus of the book really shouldn't be the serial killers. There are plenty of books written on them. The focus of the book should be you. Why a freshman, why an 18-year-old would get in touch with serial killers? Why would he spend his time researching them? And eventually, what he found out, what he got out of that experience. This professor told him people would be interested in understanding what motivated you what drove you to start doing this. To this, Jason was kind of confused. He said, well, I wouldn't even know where to start. And this teacher advised him to start from the beginning, to tell us how he got here in the first place. So let us also start from there. This part of the story begins in a bookstore. So Jason went in sort of to search for a book to read, and he was drawn to the true crime section, as many of us, but in particular, he was drawn there because his mom was always into true crime. His family dynamic was really strange. His mom was into true crime. She would read the most gruesome books and then would be like, hey, Jason, have you ever heard about this guy? This guy is so disgusting. He would kill the women and then he would skin them and keep their skin so that he would put it on as a coat. He kept a box of vaginas, he had a belt of women's nipples on it, and he also really wanted to be a woman. That's why he kept all of these souvenirs. And now you and me, even without googling, know that Jason's mom here is referring to Ed Gein. The book doesn't actually mention that. Like, I bet there were some people that, like, actually went to, like, google that and were like, what the fuck? Why doesn't this book, like, actually explain who this is all about? But Jason and when his mom told him that was like, why isn't my mom just like into cookbooks? Like, how are you shielding me from this and also in the same breath telling me about these true crime cases? And they were always shielding him from it because I think from the very early age they realized that Jason is kind of squeamish. Every time his parents kind of had to hide when they were to watch like any psychological thriller or just any horror film because Jason once kind of peeked into the room, they thought he was asleep and he saw like some bloody scenes and he had nightmares for time. And after this, his parents just kind of didn't allow him to watch any horror movies or anything of that sort. But also in the same breath, as I told you, like his mom wouldn't allow him to read any of the books. She would kind of tell him the plot and like the modus operandi of any of these guys. 
So having that in mind, Jason is now in this bookstore and he is just looking at these true crime titles. He's browsing through the shelves and all of these titles are just like surrounding blood. Blood first, the blood lust, the blood the games. And he's like, I get it. Like there was some blood spilled in all of these cases. But then he comes to this book that is called Killer Clown. And he immediately picks it up from the shelf. He's like, okay, this is different what you mean killer clown? Who was this guy? My mom never told me about this dude. So he looks sort of like into the blurb of the book and he reads a bit about Gacy. But the reason why he would end up leaving that bookstore, buying that book, wasn't even about Gacy's modus operandi or what he might have read in that blurb at the back of the book. It was mostly because Jason at that time had like a recurring nightmare. He would constantly dream about finding his grandma killed and bloodied up under the stairs and the person fleeing the scene wearing like clown's makeup or a mask. And he would always kind of wake up in sheer panic and always was thinking like, who, what normal person would be hiding behind this makeup? What normal person would be committing crimes hiding underneath a mask? Because of this nightmare, he was paralyzed just even thinking about clowns. He really had a phobia of them. And another book that drew his attention was the one called Hunting Humans. Jason at this point was a freshman at uni studying psychology, and Hunting Humans was a book taking readers on the tour of the minds, motivations, and methods of six American serial killers. After buying these books, Jason drove home, and just as he parked up his car in front of his house, he looked at the cover of the Killer Clown's book and thought, I wonder if the book answers what kind of childhood this man must have had. Was it this dark place, sort of void of sanity, or was it more a place like mine? So let's focus on Jason's own childhood. Jason was a firstborn. He had a younger brother called Jared, but for a couple of years, he was on his own. Which also, as any fellow firstborns will know, means that you're a center of attention. And that when another sibling comes into picture, you're not really too happy about it, because you were spoiled rotten by that point. So Jason had pretty much a similar childhood to every firstborns in, like, a happy, healthy families, meaning that all of his uncles, aunties, family members would play with him, and they would kind of always let him win. So Jason, from the really young age, wasn't really accustomed to losing. And there was this event from this childhood that his mom describes when a teacher actually invited them for like a one-to-one. -one, and his parents were like, oh shit, he must have fucked up. And this teacher said, no, it's actually like the complete opposite. Uh, this teacher had, like, this scoring system, right, introduced where they would deduct points on even, like, some minimal things. Like, you are late to class, divide points. Like, you chew gum or, like, you misbehave, you're loud, you speak, like, they would sort of deduct some points off you. And Jason had the perfect score, like, on everything. And this teacher was apparently strict, like, they deduct points on anything. And the parents are there, like, Okay, so you're telling me my child is perfect. Like, you sure you don't have to speak with, like, some other parents here? Like, what seems to be the problem? And the teacher said, yeah, that is the problem. That we think he's too diligent. Like, what happens once he makes a mistake? This just doesn't seem to be healthy. And the father said, no, you're actually right. We kind of see the same display of the behavior at home. So let's just agree, just take off like a point or half a point for him and let's see his reaction. And as the teacher and the parents both expected, this kind of backfired. As soon as the teacher took that point off Jason, he cried, he lost it. And he somehow felt even more motivated to work towards perfection. Because he felt, even after his parents told him that this has happened because they asked the teacher to do it, well, he said no. If the teacher really felt like they were doing things perfectly, he would have still gotten that point. 
So what he felt from the early childhood was to work hard on his goals, to work towards perfection. But every time, as it happens with most of those people, once they reach their desired goal, they kind of quickly get bored and move on, because now they're perfect in this area, so they move on to be equally good in another. So sort of in order to feel challenged. And that is what he applied, well, in both his personal life and also his school life. So Jason was very much of an athlete. He played baseball, and again, he would play until he realized that he might become second best. And that is when he would drop out of practice. The same really with bodybuilding. He was lifting weights, he was taking vitamins, different proteins, just to sustain himself. And then soon, he would get bored. He would reach some form of excellence, he would get some awards, he would get bored and move on. So, the same with the music band. He would play trumpet, he would be great at it, and then, after a certain time, he would sort of reach his peak and move on to something else. Then next was kickboxing. By the age of 11, he already won the Presidential Academic Fitness Award, and still, by his parents, he was kind of viewed as this vulnerable and weak kid, even though, well, basically, he has been training all the way up until the age of 11. And that is for, well, the reason that I have said at the beginning, that he was really squeamish. And on top of this sensitivity, he was really inquisitive. He also kind of had a peak, again, once his parents thought that he was asleep, when they were watching this movie on Holocaust. And he kind of, like, screamed, and his parents were like, shit, he saw some of it. So they spoke to him, and he just couldn't understand how this even happened. Which, I mean, I guess is everybody's first gut reaction to this. But he was just like, no, I still know of people who are Jews. Like, our family are Jews. Like, why would people still do this? His parents again ran after him in his room and tried to just console him and explain that this has happened a long time ago. It's not happening any longer. Nobody's treating Jews this way now. But what Jason couldn't grasp and what his parents couldn't really explain is how did these people sleep at night? How did Nazi German commit all of these atrocities and still were able to just move on with their life as if nothing has happened? Going into his teenage years, Friday the 13th came out. So he didn't tell his parents that he's gonna see it. Well, he asked for permission and they said, like, dude, you're squeamish to, like, anything that you even hear about. You have weak stomach. Like, you will not be able to handle it. But still, he went with his friends to the screening. And the first screening that he went to, he had his eyes closed. And even that was too much, just hearing everything happening on the screen. But then he kind of forced himself to go the second time. And soon this became a pattern. He was getting more and more into the gore, into the horror, and just sort of like forcing himself to push through it and not to like feel sickly. Soon enough, his room looked like probably most of the teenage rooms at the time, with like posters of all of these horror films, comic books on the walls and the shelves because he would subscribe to loads of horror magazines and comic books. And he liked the fact that he finally managed to convert his fear into this fascination. And this fascinated him and will be crucial psychologically towards him understanding the serial killers later. But two things happen now that kind of fuel his fascination. Well, because he was bored of everything else, he kind of started, well, exploring, like, his sexuality and started dating. But also, he seemed to be training. He said, like, it's his preparation for, like, this further research into true crime and into these killers. So on one side, it involved him becoming who he thought people wanted him to become. So he would find these ads posting by women and he would start responding to them to fit the profile that these women were looking for in their dating partner. And obviously, he didn't want to pursue it, he just wanted to see if it worked, like, what would they respond? And that would sort of mean that, well, he's been accomplished. And then on the other end, in school, he would sort of, like, stop the teachers that wouldn't even teach him, 
and would kind of, again, pretend to be either the pupil that was in their class or somebody that was really interested in the subject. And he would kind of judge from their response, would they be buying into it? With all of this training, he didn't really know where it was going. He was kind of like, okay, I'm just doing this out of boredom to see how other people react, to see what ticks each and every person. That is until there was an assignment given to him by a teacher at school to write this essay about capital punishment. And he was supposed to like hand it over in about like four months. So after this assignment has been given in class, after this class, Jason kind of stays behind and he asks this professor, how about if I was to write an essay about capital punishment from the prisoner's perspective? Like, I could write letters to them, see what their opinions are on it. Like, that would give it an edge, right? Nobody would have ever written something like this. And the professor was just like, okay, he's joking. Like, this is not gonna happen. He was like, um, there is enough research done into capital punishment for you to just hit the library and like read the books and then cite them. Like, there's no reason for you to be poking around. But by this point, Jason's mind was made. This is when we meet Jason who bought that killer clown book. And he is now at his kitchen counter reading the book and his mom kind of walks in and she's like, killer clown? Oh, damn. Isn't that the one that killed all of these kids and then tortured them and then put them under his crawl space in his house? And Jason is like, yep, that's exactly who it is. His mom's reaction is, of course, to be like, yeah, you shouldn't be reading that one. Like, you're squeamish, but also you're afraid of clowns. You're gonna be having nightmares just reading into it. But of course, she leaves him alone because they would always butt heads, as I told you, from his childhood. Like, his mom couldn't really say much because she was reading the same books. So she couldn't really shelter him forever. As Jason was reading this book, what fascinated him was why Gacy decided to turn to crime. Because here was the guy making $300,000 a year in 1970s. So that's a lot of money for even those standards. He was the head of Jaycees. He volunteered his time to help sick kids. He even met the wife of the president, Carter, at the time. And while he's doing all of this, on the side, he's torturing his victims for hours, even days at a time. What really drew Jason to continue reading this book was the fact that Gacy aimed at the guys his age and even more his brother's age. So, like, young teenage years. So, here he was, reading about some unlucky guy his age. Gacy picked up at the bus station, brought him home, and then repeatedly raped him before torturing him, playing Russian roulette with a loaded gun, and then submerging his face in a bathtub to the point where he passed out. And he was drawn to it because he obviously couldn't picture why somebody would do this. Like, he couldn't put himself in Gacy's shoes, but he put himself in his own shoes and he couldn't drop this book down because he imagined, okay, what if this was me? Because Gacy was drawn to the guys my age with sort of my physique. Some of them from the descriptions in this book actually resemble me. What if this was me? Yes, I am kind of big and fit due to the weightlifting, but would he still be able to outsmart me? Would he still be able to overpower me? And then once he finishes this book, he realizes Gacy is still alive, he's on the death row and probably in a need of diversion. He's probably bored. So he kind of puts those feelings, identifying with the victims aside, and decides, I mean, I could do some more research and sort of like implement what I'm learning in psychology at college and try to write to him. Try to see how I can get him to write back. Maybe he tells me something that he has never told anybody else about why he started to commit these crimes. And also maybe I find out something myself about how he actually lured his victims in. And Jason sort of at the forefront of all of this is thinking he wants to be an FBI profiler one day. So this is going to be something really useful for his essay that he's currently working on on capital punishment, but also long term 
to give him an edge to get into the FBI Academy, to be this great profiler. Because not everybody goes into the FBI Academy already having spoken with the serial killers. As he closed his book, another question that he realized hasn't been answered in it was whether for Gacy his 17th kill differed to his 32nd. Was he doing anything different? And also, how did he manage to successfully lead this double life for so long? Did that differ with each progressive kill or not at all? He realized that this just hasn't been answered in this book or like any other material that he could find on Gacy. So as he finishes this book, him and his family are sort of like sitting down for dinner and Jason just bursts out and says, hey, I've actually been thinking of writing letters to some serial killers. Starting with Gacy, maybe I'm gonna write to Jeffrey Dahmer or like Charles Manson. I still haven't figured those out, but I kind of am doing research on Gacy right now, so I'm definitely thinking of starting to write letters to him. And of course, this yields all sorts of different reactions from his family members. Jared is kind of just like joking there, being like, what if they write back in blood? And then his dad says like, what if they send you a pint of blood? And his mom just bursts into the conversation saying, nobody's gonna be writing to serial killers from this household. Like, what the fuck? Why would you do that? But then his dad, who was always the pacifier in this family, says like, I mean, what is the damage? Like, they are on the death row. They're gonna be put to death within a couple of months. It's not like they can do him any harm. And then Jason comes through with the real reason why he actually even brought this up at the family dinner. Because he wasn't doing this in order to ask for permission. He planned to write letters to serial killers anyways. He raised this in order to ask which address to put on the envelope. Because, of course, if he was to put P.O. box address, they won't write back. And if he was to put somebody else's address, well, then these killers still have people on the streets that they can look those up for them. So basically what he was saying is that he needs to put his home location as the actual return address on those envelopes. So that conversation didn't end up in many results. He thought, like, later he's gonna talk to his dad and actually convince him, because he didn't expect these killers to write back in the first place. So he thought, like, what is the harm? Like, he's just gonna convince his dad later, and then his dad is gonna convince his mom. He also ran this idea by his girlfriend at the time, Jen, and Jen was of Latino origin. Well, at least her parents were Latino, so she was born in that kind of household. And Jen's whole family was kind of skeptical of him in the first place. They found him weird. They thought he might have been, you know, into brujeria and witchcraft and all of that stuff because he was just, like, too much into crime. So his girlfriend also just brushed it off. She's like, I mean, this kind of does sound crazy. Like, I might start up a talk show one day being like, my boyfriend writes to serial killers. Like, are you serious about this? So at the time, nobody really understood the extent that Jason is gonna push this towards. After researching more on Gacy, Jason decided that the best approach might be for him to act as if he was sexually confused. That he was confused about his sexuality, whether or not he was gay or not, because Gacy was bisexual, as he would say, even though after he started murdering his victims, he didn't really ever sleep with his wife. So he was just raping his victims of the same sex and then murdering them. So there were always doubts in the opinions of media and writers later whether or not Casey was bisexual to begin with, or was he always just closeted. And Jason also decided the best approach might be to mirror Gacy's childhood. So sort of to write the letters as if he was bullied and abused by his own father. And in such a way, looking for a mentorship, looking for a father figure in Gacy. He knew based on his imagination, based on the movies that he has seen, that he will be able to bullshit the second thing easily, like the abuse by the father. And just based on what he read on Gacy, he's just gonna mirror the exact same thing and, you know, just change a couple of words here and there. 
What Jason was less comfortable with was this pretend homosexuality, because he knew that Gacy might be able to see through that. So, in order to train himself, well, Jason went to this gay bar in the area, and he spoke to the bartender. And I don't really know what he actually asked the man, but the man advised him to check the personal ads in the newspapers, to sort of see if there is anybody offering, like, any sex work services that he can speak with. Or maybe Jason actually told him that he is looking for a sex worker for himself. So, when he found this personal ad by a guy named Rico promising all-night companionship and experienced pleasure, what Jason had in mind was to understand how Gacy would lure his victims. Because Gacy's victims were usually people from the streets, lesser than people that didn't really have where to go, that he could promise food and shelter for. And also, a lot of times, he would promise them jobs, so they would work on his house and his properties as well. So, he just wanted to understand it from that perspective, but also to sort of be more comfortable with homosexuality himself after this training, after this interview. And after convincing Rico that he's not a cop, that he's just doing research for his university project, well, Rico started talking, and Jason was really interested to understand did anybody ever attack him? Was he ever threatened? Was his life ever in danger? And Rico told him about this experience where he went down on a guy by force, again, in a car. He was just pulled off from the street. And after that, the guy actually, well, forced him to open his mouth so that he could piss in his mouth. And he said, like, yes, he was overwhelmed by that experience and he could have bit his penis off. He could have run away, but that he just decided to be submissive in that situation because he was fearful for his life. He actually showed him the scar on his neck because this guy was holding a knife to his neck. So, he realized if he was not to obey that he will probably be killed then and there. Now that Jason had a perspective from a would-be victim, well, he went back to researching on Gacy himself. He read through the books, through hundreds of articles, he watched video interviews, and read transcripts of his trial. In these transcripts, he was particularly interested in the profiles of his victims. Physical characteristics, their interests, personality traits, ages, sexual preferences. After reading everything, he concluded that Gacy was a sexual sadist who would thrive in the pain of others. He was brutal, merciless, and was incredibly charming on the other end of it if he chose to be in order to lure these victims to his house. Because of the victim's profile, he concluded that he was a manipulator, choosing the victims that were emotionally weak, sexually confused, and vulnerable. Armed with this information, he worked on composing this letter for days, and it read, Dear Mr. Gacy, my name is Jason Moss, and I'm a full-time college student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I'm 18 years old, and I'm writing because I thought you might get bored or lonely where you are and that you might want someone to correspond with. I'm sure there are many others who write you, but I hope you take the time to write me back. You'll see that I'm a pretty nice guy, and I know what it's like to be bored and alone. The constant screaming of my father keeps me secluded in my room when I'm not in school or at the gym. I hate it here at home, and I guess I understand what it's like to need a friend. At this point, I don't really know what else to say until you write me back. If you should need anything like paper or supplies, just let me know. I would be happy to help. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Your friend, Jason Moss. Now I was trying to make him see that Jason Moss was someone worth talking to versus all the other people I assumed that he was talking to. Jason was right. He had to set himself apart. John Wayne Gacy received hundreds of letters every week. And as sick as it may sound, Gacy's notoriety had turned him into a celebrity. Soon, letters from Gacy were arriving weekly. Gacy also sent Jason some of his original artwork. Gacy's paintings were selling for thousands of dollars in posh galleries. 
Jason had to wait for about a week to get the letter back from Gacy, and when he did, he wasn't disappointed, but he immediately understood that Gacy was screening the boys that would write him in order for him to be able to decipher who he wants to write back to. Gacy sort of introduced himself with his version of events, so he sent him like a self-published article on his version saying how he was framed and how anybody could have done it because they had the access to his house. And apart from that article that was filled with grammatical and just punctuation mistakes, he attached a form with his questions for Jason. The answers he wanted to are why he wrote to J.W. Gacy, his ideal evening, his childhood hero, what nobody knows about him, thoughts on sex, thoughts on crime, and what he's thinking about right now. This is when Jason turns on his research mode on, goes back to everything that he knows about Gacy, and he will obviously have liberal thoughts on sex. He would consider bisexuality to be superior over homosexuality, he would obviously be against the death penalty, and Jason knew he would be attracted to somebody who would be easily controlled, so he carefully formulated his answers to this survey. One question asked about perfect man or woman, and Jason crossed out woman and put partner instead, sort of inclining that maybe he might be bisexual or confused about his sexuality. Then the question about nobody knowing that he is, well, Jason put the answer that he is thinking about becoming a nude dancer, and that would kind of feed into two things. One, that Gacy might be thinking, well, okay, he must be good looking, he must have a good body, I want to continue chatting with him. And the second purpose that that would fit in would be completely to a T fitting the profile of Gacy's victims. Once Jason passed the survey and Gacy actually started writing to him regularly, first of all, Jason actually hid this from his parents. Like, they didn't at first know that he was even corresponding with Gacy or any serial killers. He would kind of run back from school in order to intercept the mail lady. And second, well, Gacy's letters at first really resembled what he wrote to Richie two weeks ago when we read about about Barbara and Richie, the couple that wrote to serial killers. It isn't like actual copy-paste, I think he actually had to handwrite these letters, but it is still very similar. So let me read some parts of it so that you can spot the patterns that I spotted as well. The only thing I ask is don't assume anything of me. If you're not sure, then ask. Nothing offends me and nothing is personal. No subject is off limits, as long as you're willing to be just as open and honest with me. 80% of what is known about me in the media is fantasy. If you want my opinion on something or point of view, that's what you will get, as I'm not into stroking you, as you have your own hand for that when you get the daily urge. Ha <laughs> ha. That last line is kind of like word by word what he wrote to Richie. He uses haha, he has the same grammar, spelling mistakes, which to me indicates something that Jason wouldn't have had a knowledge of. And that is that, well, he wasn't as special as he thought he was. He thought like Gacy chose him over I don't know how many boys, and I mean, he wasn't delusional in a way that he knew that Gacy was writing to other men and boys that contacted him, but he probably thought that they had more of a bond and that his research kind of yielded more of a special connection with Gacy, while Gacy kind of just wrote like this to anybody that would write to him. And had Jason known this, maybe he wouldn't have committed as much time as he had into cross-referencing, researching, making sure that every response fits exactly what Gacy would like to hear. And this is really in this book when you kind of see the split where Jason can't take himself out of the situation. He can't see it from the third person's perspective, because even without any knowledge of how many people Gacy would have communicated with, you know, if he managed to kind of extract himself out of the situation, he would have maybe seen it from the angle of Gacy. He would have maybe put himself into his shoes, seeing that he could be messing with so many people. He is 
bored as hell on the death row, he could be using this as his distraction. Rather, he just saw it from the angle of how he can stand out. And that is where the rest of the book will really lead to. That's why I'm pointing it out, because Jason kind of just from this point on sees it from his own angle. And the whole focus is how he can stand out when communicating with these serial killers. Instead of maybe why do they correspond with anybody in the first place. What Jason was really great at, due to his research, was really pinpointing what Gacy wanted to hear. So, he would write the letters saying sort of like he hasn't tried much in terms of sexual experiences, but he's open to it, and that Gacy could write back to him in as much details as he wanted. This is when Gacy also started offering him advice. So, he was obsessed with masturbation or jacking off, as he would say. And at first, it was just Gacy writing to Jason about his own sexual experiences, about what he tried with women and with men, and that sex is all about just getting each other off. And it was gross and graphic, but then later it kind of started being instructive. Like, this is what you should do. You should go into a headstand and jack yourself off. And then tell me once you do it how that made you feel. Describe it to me. So, Jason really had to play off on his imagination in order to continue the lies and the deception here. Casey offered his own views on sexuality. To me, when you're, when you're having sex with somebody, irregardless of who it is, the object is the sensation of getting each other off. It's not love. It's, it's just a physical desire. So, Gacy thought that he was leading you towards these things, that he was the master puppeteer and you were his half-witted student. He would lead me, so to speak, and I would just follow his lead. He would tell me how you know, men should pick me up or men will treat me. But really, he was telling about how he picked boys up and how he treated boys. Gacy was obsessed about talking of getting somebody off. And the power that he had about getting somebody off first before he himself gets off. But in every single letter where he would actually talk about having sex with somebody, so not just checking off, he always would mention the consensual part of it, because he probably knew that these letters were also monitored, so he didn't want anything to sort of sound like, mm, the police might have actually been right. And Jason had another idea of why Gacy might have been mentioning consensual sex so much, and that is that maybe in Gacy's mind, getting somebody off first meant that, well, the rest of it was consensual. So then, playing Russian roulette, everything that he had done next, he might have justified in his psyche as being consensual as well. At this point, he did share with his parents that he was communicating with Gacy, but they never knew the full extent of it. He was still intercepting the post, and they didn't know the psychological toll this was taking on him yet. Because with every letter, with every piece of communication that was happening between Jason and John Wayne Gacy, well, he would kind of have, like, a gist of energy. He felt flattered that Gacy chose to communicate with him with this frequency above everybody else. And he also felt like it was taking more and more energy out of him, like all of this research, working on these letters for hours on end, sometimes not sleeping, like his last thoughts of the day being what I should write to him next, how I should lure him in, what I should do to get this piece of information. He would feel like each letter Gacy wrote to him was like a trophy given to him by Gacy that he was validating him, affirming him in a way that his parents rarely did, and that made him grateful, in a way. And just like when, in these videos, I analyze this from the perspective of the killers, from the perspective of the perpetrators, here I kind of have to point a couple of places in this video where Jason could have stopped. He could have stopped writing to Gacy, he could have stopped writing to any of the people that we are going to talk about in the rest of this video. And also, I feel like 
this, if anything, is really the point of no return. Because he started seeing the communication that he had with the notorious serial killer as a relationship. Not a sexual relationship, but more as a friendship. Jason didn't forget that the whole purpose of this was getting Gacy to actually talk about his crimes and to maybe actually fess up to something that he didn't confess to the FBI, to the actual law enforcement. So he would kind of always steer all of this, like, talk about masturbation and sexual and, like, confused sexual identity to his actual crimes. And every single time, Gacy managed to find a loophole, to be like, well, actually, I was framed for it. There were so many people with the access to my house, and it would really look dumb on the police to admit that they were wrong. That is why my execution date is actually getting postponed more and more. Come on, Jason, like, don't you see it? The police was definitely wrong. This is why they can't even execute me, because my appeals will seem to be prolonged longing it, but they also can't admit that they were wrong. So every time Jason would call him up on something, on like one of the numerous victims, Casey kind of managed to convince him that, hey, maybe his idea of his own innocence isn't as crazy as it seems to everybody. Which made Jason feel some sort of sympathy towards Casey. But not in a way that, again, once we talk about these serial killers, you feel sympathy about their childhood. You feel sympathy about the bad things that were happening to them. Jason was more identifying to Gacy and who he is now, and that he might have been framed for all of this. And that's why I'm saying, like, this for me is kind of the point of no return. Because once he could humanize somebody like Gacy, well, he wouldn't want to go back on that relationship, go back on that friendship. He wanted to continue and get more and more information out of him. And from Gacy's point of view, if you're looking at this, well, the trap has worked. This man is trapped now, and he has his entertainment in prison. And he's just gonna hook him in more and more until he's completely under his spell. You mentioned you have a brother, 14. Is he into sports like you, and do you get along with him? You mention your brother with no name or photo. I would think if you're close, then share that and give him a name. Say hi to your brother. Tell him to stay with it, playing baseball, but enjoy life as well. Few letters in, John wanted to chat to Jason more and more about Jared, about his 14-year-old brother. Because if you really think about it in terms of pedophilia, which technically is who John Wayne Gacy was beyond being a serial killer, which somehow we don't really talk about, the fact that he had a preferential age and that age was under the age of 18. Well, Jason was too old for him. Jason was already 18, 19 at the time, and his brother was just a perfect victim. So, Jason knew that. Like, he was scared shitless, he was probably breaking it, and just sort of realized, like, how didn't I think of this? I mentioned my family, I mentioned a brother. He is, of course, going to start asking about the 14-year-old and wanted to communicate with him. So, Jason brought this up with Jared, and Jared was like, no, I am not doing it. I am not doing what you are doing, like, spending my whole days communicating with a serial killer. That's sick. So, the best Jason could do was convince his brother Jared to just sign off on the letters. So, now he started doing double the work. He was composing these two letters, being himself, well, his fake persona, his fake self, and also pretending to be Jared, writing to Gacy. In terms of other members of his family, Jason would always write about this dynamic with his father. So, there would be times when Jason would say that he actually wanted to kill himself because of the relationship that he had with his father. And Gacy would say, well, if you kill yourself and if you die, then they are the ones who'll win. I learned to turn all my anger inwards, and you'll soon learn how to not let people like that get to you. There are other ways to handle those situations. So, Jason here is reading this thinking, well, maybe he's finally telling me how he would strike out on others to compensate for the abuse that he had as a child. He would continue, I'm here for you, Jason. I'm your friend, your only friend, the only friend you need. 
Right now, you need your parents because you have nowhere else to live. Keep hustling and the money will be rolling in and you can move out. Maybe I could help out in the future too. That as well became twofold. On one side of things, he was obviously trying to build rapport with Gacy, whose dad was always abusive to him, always found him to be a sissy. And Gacy still loved his dad very much. Like, he was still very much shaken once his dad died. And even as a child, he was kind of submissive to his father. And the second purpose that dad had was that Jason always... I think he partially looked at this as his way out. To sort of say, like, hey, my dad is abusive, I might end up on the street anytime. Also, okay, this might be more than twofold, partially he was doing this to explain that him, Jason, apparently had interest in older women. And that is because his father was always the passive one and my mother is always overbearing, so maybe I'm seeing these women as my mother and I'm attracted to them. And also that part of abuse which might land Jason to end up on the streets could have been a way out, as I said, as in Jason introducing a way out to stop communicating with Gacy because if he ends up on the streets, well, he won't have the ways to write to him in prison. But what he wanted from it at this very moment, writing to him, was the opportunity for Gacy to kind of tell him, well, how would he sell himself? what is the best way for him to sort of, like, remain submissive? Should he remain submissive in the first place? To which case he was like, yes, most definitely, please remain submissive to me and to your dad as well. And also, well, how to sell himself, how to present himself towards others. By coaching him, by giving him advice of how he would actually make money selling his body, well, Gacy was coaching Jason of how he would become a perfect victim. In this weird dynamic, Jason wasn't always, like, 100% on point. Sometimes, you know, he would get things out of Gacy's letters and he would be like, oh, wait, I didn't actually think about this. Now this is how I need to respond to feed into what he wants me to answer, to keep him interested, otherwise he's gonna stop writing and then I won't get any information out of him any further. On this occasion, Gacy kind of started pestering him, being like, what, no man ever hit on you and you were into sports, you did kickboxing, weightlifting, baseball, and you're telling me that not a single man ever hit on you. So Jason was like, okay, now I need to, like, to fulfill this fantasy and invent this whole story of how actually I kind of lied, I have been hit on by a man before, and then exploring the homosexuality in that way. And by doing so, that opened the front for him to ask Casey about his sexual experiences with men and with women. And Gacy always did this gross thing, this grossed me out throughout this whole book, which was describing how great he was at performing oral sex. And according to Gacy, to men and to women equally. And in my opinion, Gacy was doing all of this in order to just impose power, to show himself, even to Jason, to any kid that would write to him, that he still had a power. And as such, as such an experienced man with so much under his wing, that he could guide Jason, and again, anybody else writing to him, he could guide him through any sexual experience, that he could be his mentor. And in this way, he saw right through Jason, through his desire for approval, which we spoke about from his background. Jason desired approval, wanted to win constantly, all the way throughout his life. But it's only the fact that he didn't want the approval about his sexuality, just rather that he desired approval in life. This is a collect call from inmate John Gacy from the Menard Correctional Center. To accept a call, say yes after the tone. What's up, buddy? I know this is probably awkward for you. Just relax. I'm watching TV right now, just hanging out in my cell. What about you? This is when the calls would begin. Casey kind of suggested it through his letters, like, oh, too bad that we're not speaking on the phone. And from then on, every Sunday, after he admitted to pay 
for the cost of the phone calls because of course Jason's parents were like no if he pays yeah then do whatever the hell you want because you're too deep into this anyways and again they saw no harm to all of this so after that, Gacy and Jason agreed to speak every Sunday, and Jason had a direct line in his room. So one day, out of nowhere, Gacy just dialed that number. And with the introduction of calls, on top of three or four letters a week that Gacy would send him, on top of the pornographic magazines, photos of nude men, and his own paintings, finally Jason kind of had an overview of who Gacy was right now and the lifestyle he was living. He understood, finally, that even within prison, Gacy still managed to live like a celebrity, with a private cell, TV set, money to spend from the sale of his paintings, and with the money to spend having the guards in his pocket. And with these privileges and now regular phone calls, I don't want to say the communications dried up, but nothing new was popping up. Like, they were in a routine where Gacy would kind of mentor him, tell him that he's his only friend, give him all of these advice, and then, well, Jason would feed into that and would tell him, like, about his sexual experiences. But then, out of the blue, something that Jason did not expect happened. One Sunday, as they were speaking on the phone, Gacy kind of started saying, like, I mean, yes, you are dating that girl, but she isn't really giving it to you. Like, you really want to experiment with a man. And, well, who would be better to experiment with than your own brother, Jared? He started suggesting that Jason and Jared should start this incestuous relationship that their parents, of course, should not know about. And from that point on, he wasn't dropping it. Like, he would insist that Jason needs to go into the room once the parents are asleep, so to go under the covers and then just start masturbating Jared off. And he would get really graphic when it comes to these descriptions. And now, well, Jason had another problem. The fact that he will need to start describing an incestuous relationship that he needs to start with his own brother in order to keep these conversations going. I want to mention, like, another point where you maybe could think about stopping all of this, all these communications, but he, he just doesn't. Just yet another point in the story when these communications could have been stopped. He could have been like, I ended up on the streets. Sorry, can't communicate no more. Bye, Gacy. But uh, no, he didn't. He started feeding into these delusions and Gacy was here for it. In order for Jason to share all of the details and to actually commit incest with his brother, Gacy started sharing his own incestuous relationship with his sister. Now, from any sources, interviews, any online material, and books on Gacy, this has never been made public. In a sense, like, Jason and, well, myself really think that this never actually really happened. I mean, unless, obviously, his sister ever said it and it just wasn't made public, and Gacy only decided to share it with one person in his life through the letters and the calls that could technically be on the record. But Jason thought that this might just be sort of like replication of his fantasies. The way that Jason kind of lied and portrayed all of these fantasies in his letter to Gacy, he really thought that based on the descriptions that Gacy was making, that this might be just a fantasy towards maybe a victim that he couldn't have. And that is because this is, again, graphic, and I'm just going to briefly mention it and then move away from it. But Gacy went in detail to describe how he would enter his sister's room and then would please her, of course, orally, because he was the master, apparently, of oral sex, and he would please her with his tongue, and then they would turn and do 69 as, as teenagers. So that's why... Both Jason and me here kind of agree that probably did not happen. Guess he just probably wanted Jason to really go for it and commit incest with his brother in order for him to be entertained. But also, if you start thinking about the bigger picture, there is a really sinister motive for this that we will speak about in the end. 
At this point, the communication between the two is kind of fluid. And again, I'm not gonna say that Jason was bored at any point, but there's nothing much more that he can get from Gacy. It will just continue this way, and he will sort of see where each letter leads to. You're like, oh, we are wrapping this up. He stopped. He just continued. He went on to a party. He just left Gacy behind. No, why, why would you say that? Go ahead. Instead of leaving this behind, instead of going back to his normal freshman lifestyle, well, Jason decides why not research other serial killers and start communicating with them as well. This drives me back to that point that I mentioned about Jason's background, where he gets satisfied by something, he thinks he has reached its peak, and then he moves on to the next thing that will challenge him more. So, who... On top of your head, if you were to think about who would the most challenging person be to write to, we would probably all have one serial killer's name in common, and that would be Charles Manson. Jason's research into Charles revealed that he was the leader of a cult composed of male and female hippies who were known as the Family. They were convicted of nine murders, including the killing spree of the Hollywood star Sharon Tate, who was pregnant at the time when they tortured her and stabbed her dozens of times. Manson and seven other members were sentenced to death in 1972, but his sentence got commuted to life in prison a year later when the Supreme Court abolished the death penalty. At the time of his research, Manson was the resident of the California prison system and he would be making up news every time he would come up for parole. What Jason understood, though, through his research was that even though Manson was locked away, he still had several members of the family outside, and he still had a large influence both within prison and outside its doors. He knew that his own defense attorney was found murdered after the guilty verdict came in, and he still must have some power over his followers, because one of them, Lynette Squeaky From, actually attempted to assassinate a president, but her pistol misfired. Which led Jason to believe that this was still upon Manson's orders from prison. Jason again put himself in a position where he was researching, immersing himself, watching all of the interviews, finding all of the court documents, and what he realized from that was that Manson was the most unpredictable person ever. Like, there were some interviews when he was completely coherent, and he also knew that Manson must be coherent to a certain degree to convince other people to kill on his behalf. But then there were others when, you know, he would be, like, sitting on different chairs in the interrogation room and just would seem to be completely out of it, saying anything and everything. And he kind of thought, okay, maybe Maybe this is a manipulation tactic. Maybe this was done on purpose as well. He'd research by day and then work on that first letter at night, sort of applying that research to it. And here he realized that, unlike with Gacy, where he had to present himself as the perfect victim, with Manson he had to present himself as a perfect follower. So when he sent his first letter out to Manson, he kind of said that they had a mutual friend in New York called John Solders, and that this guy said, like, hey, Manson can help. What could Manson help with? with? Well, he kept it broad. Uh, Jason said that he wanted to save men and women, and that Manson, of course, as the god savior, can save humanity so he can help him out. And also, he chose every word carefully. He said he doesn't have much money, but he has a car and he has his bitch by his side, so Manson could just advise and he will do anything to save humanity. So, of course, Manson responded. And he was flattered that for a change, somebody was not asking him for anything of his, like a souvenir or a signature. And this is what Jason did on purpose. He wanted to present himself as somebody who would follow the lead, who actually wanted help from Manson, rather than somebody asking something of him. 
So Manson accepted to help him save the humanity for a small price that is subscription to some magazines. And he also told him to read up on certain literature. So he would give him like these book recommendations that he should read up on. But what frightened Jason is that Manson actually mentioned he should get in touch with one of his followers on the outside. This man, again, from New York, that should supply him with some further literature. And now, well, Jason was freaking out because, of course, that would mean that that man on the outside would have his address as well and might be checking up on him. But Jason still communicated with this person, got some packages from him, and he actually told him where he moved to. So Jason actually passed that information on to the FBI. He just never knew if anything happened out of that, but they were like... (laughs) Keep an eye on this man. He's in communication with Charles Manson, as am I, but, you know, I'm just completely innocent. I'm doing it for scientific purposes. I'm saving humanity. Soon enough, Jason wasn't getting what he wanted from communication with Manson. He was as unpredictable as Jason could have guessed, but also he would kind of turn on Jason, and he in particular didn't like the fact that Jason was a student, that he was into books, that he was following some rules by the establishment. They teach you one world, but when you go to live, what you forget, you learn that people has been bullshitting you. You can't find yourself in anyone else. You're your own experiences, and they can't teach you your life. With Manson, possibly even more so than with Gacy, Jason kind of felt like he needed a cleanse. He needed a shower every time he would even read one of his letters. So he extracted himself out of that correspondence pretty quickly, after probably only a couple of letters. And at that same time, out of curiosity, he went to one of those shops, which I don't know if there are these kind of shops today, but one of the shops that would sell memorabilia, but among it, they would sell famous autographs. And of course, like, mostly 99% of these autographs would be from, like, famous singers, performers, actors. But Jason went in and he asked, like, hey, do you sell, like, any memorabilia and autographs of uh, infamous serial killers. And which one would go for the most? And this guy told him, without, like, a shred of a doubt, without a split-second thinking, Jeffrey Dahmer. And Jason is there like, oh, wait, is that the, the cannibal, the Milwaukee cannibal guy who, like, ate some of his victims? And the guy's like, yes. So, what's so special about him? Well, you see, Dahmer doesn't actually like to write back to people. Weirdly, yes, but there's maybe only, like, one or two guys in the whole of the States that might have actually gotten a letter from Dahmer. So, of course, Jason here sees a challenge. He started off his research by calling Milwaukee Police Department here and ordering a copy of Domer's 230-page confession. Because Domer might not have liked to write, but Domer sure as fuck liked to talk. As he continued his research, Jason realized that Dahmer was charged with the murder of 15 males, all homosexual, all young, mostly minorities. Once he was arrested, the remains of 11 victims were still found in his acid tanks that he kept in his flat, as well as in his fridge, because he would also dismember them. It didn't take him long to realize that one reason why Dahmer resorted to cannibalism is that he wanted to keep a part of his victims inside of him. And as such, he had huge attachment issues and a pathological fear of being alone. Further research showed him that sometimes Dahmer had sex with his victims when they were alive, but that also he would usually have both oral and anal sex with their corpses. So he was also engaging in necrophilia, which confirmed another thing that Jason was to use in his letters to entice Dahmer, and that was his powerful sexual appetite. So here, unlike with Gacy, who would engage in these psychological games, Charles Manson, who was unpredictable but looking for a follower, not somebody asking him of things, here he just knew purely. He just needs to be straight up. This is who I am. I'm offering myself to you on a plate. Because Dahmer was not looking for any psychological games. He was just looking for somebody else in his life in order for him not to be alone. 
So when composing the letter to him, Jason decided that he should be seen as this boy who was all alone in the world, just as depraved as Dahmer was. And his goal would be to get Dahmer to share some coping advice that he had from his own experiences, or the ways that he would try to avoid his own pain. So in the first letter, he would tell Dahmer that he would be taking care of his sick grandmother, and that is why he is writing very late at night. Dahmer, at first, when he killed, he killed in his grandmother's basement. There's a whole case on this channel, but that's where that information is coming from. He alluded at how scared he is because both of his parents have died, so now he was scared that his grandma will die, leaving him all alone. And if him and Dahmer can just be friends, like, does he need everything? Because just the thought of Dahmer and him striking up this friendship and making him feel less alone would be everything that he needs. Now, with this overlap of him communicating with multiple serial killers at a time, it was getting to his head, and it was taking a toll on his life. Like, Jen wasn't able to build rapport with him or to understand him any longer. His parents were kind of freaking out every time he would mention something like this, but yet were not seeing all of the letters to understand the full extent of the psychological toll this was taking on him. And also, as I mentioned, this kind of went beyond that sympathy that you would feel for somebody's bad experiences in life or bad childhood. Because he started feeling that, like, pang jolt of happiness once he would get the letters. And when he started thinking about this as, like, a bigger picture, he realized that his best friends suddenly started being all of these serial killers instead of real-life people that he actually knew, that he was neglecting now because of this. And what was fucking with him even more psychologically was that it wasn't even that this relationship was with serial killers. It was the fact that it was built on lies, on deception, on things that he would conjure up in his mind in order to, like, get them to write back. And this was just on the daily mentally messing with his head. Suddenly, instead of, like, career prospects, instead of his plans for the future, he started thinking about, oh, what should the next letter to Dahmer be? What should the one to Manson be? Like, those were his thoughts before even going to bed. And what frightened him the most was how he was identifying with them. He would try to justify whatever they would say. He would try to think of the motivations why they would have done it, thinking, well, they must have been made this way, and just trying to make more and more excuses for the way that they were. While he was waiting for Dahmer's response, he kind of gave up on it, and he was thinking, I mean, what was I even thinking? Like, I was lucky for somebody to even respond. And then those thoughts kind of converted into, well, I should really contact the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, and Henry Lee Lucas, and so try my luck with them as well. But then a few weeks after he wrote his first letter to Dahmer, he finally received a letter back. And he immediately went to his mom to sort of, like, rub it into her nose, and he just felt, like, insane amount of happiness over this. He opened up a letter to see, sort of, like, did the fruits of his labor work out this time? And sure as hell they did. Because here, yet again, to draw the similarities to the case we spoke about two weeks ago, Jeffrey, again, followed the same pattern. He told Jason here to send him any pictures of himself, his body, his torso in particular, but not to send Polaroids. And here we finally find out that the reason behind not receiving Polaroids was that apparently prisoners can lick, like, the back of Polaroids, and it has a lot of chemicals that would then poison them or kill them, something along those lines, so they weren't allowed in prison. Dahmer also asked him for subscriptions to some magazines, of course, gay in nature, with a lot of nudity in them, and apparently, again, they couldn't subscribe to those magazines themselves, they can only receive them as gifts. Here, this was progressing too fast, even for Jason, in the sense that he knew that this will just be no psychological games, just Dahmer wanting to see him posing in different positions. So, he kind of sent him, like, a picture of him 
shirtless on the beach with his friends and he thought okay this should hold you off for a couple of weeks while I correspond with other people. So he told him he has some schoolwork to do and he will get back to him in a couple of weeks time. What Jason couldn't have known was that Dahmer will end up being killed in prison by another prisoner in the gym, or I think they were cleaning the toilets or whatnot. I don't really remember. I know that he was bashed with the gym pole in the head. And here he felt frustrated, you know. You would have thought, like, okay, cool, one person less on my list, like, of people to communicate with. But no, because Jason now thought, like, okay, this is an opportunity lost. I could have really had something here in terms of, like, information from Domer that other people might not have had. I've done all of this research and now it's all gone for good. The opportunity is just gone. So, instead of what every normal person would do in this situation, he starts researching another serial killer, the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. In this whole story, there's like hundreds of times where you're like, a logical solution is staring you right in the face. Nope, uh -huh, you're going the logical pathway. Okay, I guess. <laughs> During his spree between 1984 and 1985, Richard Ramirez broke into homes of people, raping women, torturing them and leaving them for dead. By the time he was captured, he killed at least 14 and raped dozens more. If you know anything about Ramirez's case, you know that he was unpredictable, but not like Manson. More like he didn't have a type, he didn't have the age preference. He literally was just looking for an easy access to somebody's house. His only pattern would be to either ask people who he was raping to pray to Satan, to call Satan's name, or he would be leaving satanic symbols carved into their flesh. Ramirez would be sending his responses on a particular stationery as well. He would have these two skeletons holding hands at the bottom of it. Sometimes he would send him these drawings where he would portray himself as the devil, sort of like holding 666 written in his hand, kind of like the way he would appear in his court proceedings. He also asked Jason for hardcore Asian bondage magazines and he asked him to send him the pictures of his girlfriends. So Jason yet again goes, asks one of his friends to send him like the picture of these models. Because Richard wouldn't know who these women are, are they his friends or not. And it was only palpable to Jason how deep he really was in once Ramirez sent him the outline of his handprint. Again, for some reason, he thought that that would appeal to his follower. So he sends him the outline of his handprint and Jason kind of places his own hand against this, knowing that his hands have raped and killed so many women. Knowing that Richard didn't have an ounce of remorse, that he was actually proud of the work that he had done. Death is more than a word or action that takes place. There's no word for it. It's a feeling. One of immense, intense and delicious nature. Everyone cries, but death is good. At this time, because of his overlapping correspondence with multiple serial killers, this has been taking a toll on Jason. Both in school, his grades kind of went from straight A's to just B's, neglecting his family and his family not understanding the psychological toll this is taking on him, but also in his personal life, he was getting more and more just paranoid. There was this occasion when him and Jared went to see a movie in the cinema and even before the screening, Jared is just sitting there innocently like waiting for the ads to start showing and eating his cereal. And Jason in the meantime is observing this man who is just randomly sitting a few seats away with a bag next to him in his seat. And he's just freaking out. He's like, nope, this man must have a gun in that bag. Why would the bag be next to his seat? And he got so paranoid, thinking that this man is going to conduct this massacre in this cinema, that he actually made Jared leave the cinema before the screening even began. And uh, Jared was really pissed with him for quite a few weeks. He just thought that this needs to stop. Eventually this needs to stop or it will just take a toll over every single part of Jason's life. 
In order to fully go back and focus on Gacy, Jason realized he needs to kind of temporarily at least break it off with Ramirez, and for that he thought of this excuse that he landed in prison and he needs to go off for some time because he is in prison for beating his girlfriend. And of course this piqued Richard's interest, like why did you beat her? Oh, how did you do it? Did you put needles into her hands and feet? You know, normal questions that a person would ask you when they hear that kind of comment. But Jason used that line of questioning to fire those questions right back and get some information on what feelings Richard Ramirez was going through just before his kills. And Richard would advise him that he always needs to be calm if he actually wants to, you know, God forbid, kill his girlfriend one day. He needs to be calm. He needs to take in the experience, smell the aroma, smell the hectic energy of the place, and he also needs to assure that he cleans up the scene afterwards. He needs to always tidy up after him, meaning clean up all of the forensic evidence. And this is the first time, which is really weird, but at least this is the first time he mentions it in the book, that Jason actually thinks about this from a perspective of all of the other people that might be writing to these killers at the same time that he is, that are actually like budding criminals that actually want to either do copycat murders or that these criminals can use in order to enact their actions that they can't from prison through these letter writers. It occurred to Jason for the first time that there were probably people carrying on the work of these serial killers themselves, and they would have perfect mentors in these willing correspondents from prison. And he found this to be really unsettling, but not unsettling enough not to go back to corresponding with Gacy. Where we left that correspondence, if you by any chance managed to forget, because I wish I was you in that case, because I could never forget, this is so disturbing, was with the incestuous relationship that now Jason had to sell to Gacy that he started having with his brother Jared. What you need to understand here is that this dynamic will now completely change, because Jason is now a perpetrator of sorts. Until this point, he was just a perfect victim for Gacy, but now Jared is in that role of a victim, because he's victimized by both Gacy and supposedly Jason. And Jason is also, if you remember, writing letters both as himself and as his little brother. So he needs to go psychologically both into how he would write them from the perspective of a perpetrator and also how his brother would correspond with JC now that he has been sexually assaulted by his own brother. And this is when the worst in Gacy really pops onto the surface, because he starts using the technique techniques that he was using in the outside world before he got captured. He wanted the two brothers to reenact the crimes that now he couldn't any longer. He wanted Jared to sit on Jason's chest and for Jason to perform oral sex on him from this position, which from research Jason knew that this is exactly how he used to torture his own victims back in the day. And on the other end, again something that he used to do on the outside was using bribery. So Gacy would bribe Jared to sort of describe what he was going through and to guide him even further. And how could he do this from prison? Well, the only way that he could was by bribing Jared with one of his paintings. Which, just like with the letters, with the confessions, with this whole plot, Jared was completely unaware of. So now Jason, in his safe where he was hiding all of these things from his family, had a couple of paintings of Gacy that he has been using to bribe him and his own brother and get them more psychologically dependent on him. So if we are looking at that dynamic from Gacy's side, now he didn't have just one, but two submissive perfect victims one that could reenact everything that he would say, and the other one that would need to comply, because they would be complying with their own brother. 
So when Jason next corresponded with Gacy, he started playing on that psychology, asking him, well, how did you use to outsmart these boys? And Gacy here for the first time says, well, once you come for a visit, I can give you all of these private lessons on all of these things that you want to know. And now Jason is really breaking it because this is not letters, this is not phone calls. Now he needs to go into a prison where Gacy is, where Gacy is fully in control. That is if he wants to continue this relationship that he has with him. Because if he was to back out now, well, the chances are that Gacy will stop writing back to him. So, I don't think it was ever a question in Jason's mind whether or not he will actually end up going in prison, but he knew that he had to convince his parents, and he also kind of wanted to alleviate his doubts, so he did what he did the best, which was research. So, he spoke with his parents, and of course, at first they were losing their mind over this, but then he knew, like, how obsessed his mom was with true crime, so he kind of played the angle of, well, how how many people can really say that they interview serial killers, mom? Come on, this will give me the edge for the FBI Academy in the future as well. And then he also did call the FBI Academy to sort of get advice from people that have interviewed Gacy in the past, and he was passed around a few people. But they did give him some advice, but the most substantial advice that they gave him was that he might have some files on all of the victims and to try to get his eyes or to pictures of those files to sort of pass on to them to give some more information to the families. To alleviate both himself and his parents in particular, he asked Gacy to speak with the warden. So Gacy, of course, was like, yes, yeah, say when and where, I can connect the line right now. So, of course, he connects the line to the supposed warden, which later we will find out was just one of the guards that was in his pocket. And this person told him and the family how of course, uh, once he comes to visit Gacy in the death row, there is going to be glass between the two of them. They won't be able to touch each other. Gacy will be shackled. There's a couple of guards at the door. So his parents were like, okay, this sounds like a safe kind of situation. His parents were still hesitant. Of course, this is a serial killer. He is going to prison, but still, it is a death row. They could never really know these security measures to their fullest extent, but also, where is he gonna stay? Like, Jason, up until that point, never left Nevada, like, never left Las Vegas, and now he has to go to St. Louis for a couple of days just to visit this person in prison. But Gacy decides to cover all of his costs and to have one of his attorneys pick him up from the airport and then bring him to this hotel. And this attorney was to drive him back and forth from prison every day. So, of course, this again reassures his parents. It was different times, but like, let's say this assures his parents. They obviously didn't have the method to check for this person's credentials, because just like with everything else, this person wasn't the attorney. He was doing some of Gacy's legal chores, and he was communicating with his attorneys, and he would also be bringing him, like, supplies, magazines into prison. So, he was one of those go-to people that Gacy had on the outside that would do his dirty bidding for some money. Finally, everything is organized, and this supposed attorney, let's call him Ken, because I think that is his name, or they have changed it for the book, he picks him up from the airport, and he brings him to this motel. At the reception, Ken says, yeah, one room for two, please. And Jason starts sweating. He starts losing his... He's like, no, I need to get myself out of this situation. He's like, no, my parents actually want me to pay. Like, this is unacceptable. No, they insisted. The only reason why I'm here is because, you know, they gave me some money to pay for my own room so that I don't fully depend on John. 
And Ken, on the other hand, is insisting that this is what John would have wanted. But Jason kept adamant that, like, the only way he's staying and actually going to visit John is if he has a separate room. Trying to get desperately out of this situation that would have possibly ended up in him being raped by this Ken person. Jason, by this point, knew exactly how Gacy operated, and he suspected that instead of paying Ken for all of these trips back and forth to prison, that, well, he told him all about the proclivities, all about these homosexual experiences that Jason fessed up to, including probably the supposed incest, and that he was using Jason as a gift to Ken to pay him for these services. Nothing happens here, the two of them are in separate rooms, and next day, once they wake up, Ken drives Jason to prison. And death row is a completely separate section of prison, and from the sounds of this particular correctional facility in St. Louis, it is just really deep inside. So, Jason, who is already stressed, probably has not slept much because, you know, he was monitoring the door and whether or not Ken is gonna come in. And also thinking about his visit to Gacy is now even more fearful because in this prison, they are just warning him, in the case of any hostage negotiations, we aren't going to negotiate for your life, just so you know. They're just matter-of-fact explaining this to him, like, I'm sorry, but if we cave in for one prisoner, then we might need to cave in for many others. So, if your life is in danger, I'm sorry, but, like, you are dead. It is unlikely, though, but still, you're kind of, like, dead. So, Jason is just there, like, going through multiple doors, signing multiple papers to basically give his life away if anything was to happen. And finally, after going through the last door, he finds himself in what at first he thinks to be a visitation room, and he finds himself face to face with Gacy. As soon as he walks in there, Gacy just tells him, come on, Jason, and he leads him to this furthest room down the corridor, as far away from the guards as possible, and I think at this moment, if anything, it really hit Jason, the amount of power that Gacy actually had in this prison, and the fact that everything that whoever spoke to his parents promised those parents was a complete and utter lie. This room that they walk into was the tiniest room, almost claustrophobic, probably done on purpose, with just this desk and two chairs side by side, and he obviously offers him one of the chairs to sit on. And sort of looking directly at the room next door, Jason figures this must be like some janitorial kind of room. There's a mop, there's some rusty chains, and there is a chair that kind of looks like it was purposely placed in that room. And he's just thinking, like, everything here is done for a purpose. Gacy placed that chair there. And I am as far away from the guards as possible. Gacy only has, like, a loose pair of handcuffs on him. He isn't as shackled as they say he would be, and there's clearly nothing separating me from him. The conversations at first was just, like, random small talk about how he traveled, about weather, about Ken, the lawyer guy. And then, suddenly, Gacy just turned. He started losing patience, and he said, you know the writings about you and your brother? How bad it would be if somebody was to take him away? You know, if I was to hand these writings over to the police, I mean, they're pretty descriptive. This incestuous relationship of yours is pretty descriptive and pretty illegal, if you think about it. Do you want your brother taken away from you and the family? Do you want to go to jail? And Jason is there like, why are you saying things like this? Why are you telling me this? I thought the two of us were friends. To which John replied, I didn't say I would do it. Just remember who I am. And Jason tries to stroke his ego, saying, I remember who you are. You gave me everything. You are my mentor. You are my friend. Suddenly, they move on swiftly to just, again, talking about the case. 
Gacy in this room had like on the floor at first that dossier that the FBI wanted Jason to take a peek into and he called it super secret case files. And these files had everything from autopsy pictures, which I have no idea how he got access to, to the case notes, to the court proceedings, to obviously support his own versions of the story. So they kind of briefly look at that, and then Casey changes the topic again. At this point, the guards walk in with their lunch, because of course Casey planned for the two of them to have their lunch together, and he ate most of Jason's food as well. And at that point, Jason asks, like, oh, when are the guards coming back, you know, to pick up the trays? And Gacy has a light switch moment again, telling him, do you know how long it would take these guards to get to you? Probably two minutes. By that point, I could stab you with this pen. I could strangle you with these handcuffs. You would be down here lying, bleeding on the floor. Then he switches from that aggressive tone of voice, saying to him, well, actually, I have a gift for you. And out of his pocket, he takes out this small bottle of oil. And he tells him, you see that chair in the corner? That is where I plan to do you, until they find you with your blood running on the floor. To most of these threats, Jason wouldn't even respond, mostly because he would find himself to be frozen. He knew that technically he could overpower Gacy. He had the handcuffs on, and Jason was stronger, he was younger, he was in better shape. But he finally realized that he always wanted to understand what victims went through just before Gacy killed them, and he finally did. He seems to have already been just broken down by this man, so the only thing that he knew how to do was to try to switch up topics and go back to speaking about this logbook. As he would be immersed into this logbook, just looking at all of the pictures, looking at all of the notes about the phone calls that Gacy would have from prison, he didn't notice that Gacy was standing behind him and he kind of clenched him by his neck and threw him against the wall. And at first, Jason is like, okay, this is attack, like, I should defend myself. But then he realized that Gacy was actually attempting to make out with him. And this kind of infuriated him even more from what he said. Gacy started taking his pants off. He would be saying, like, do you know how many people died for this COCK? I should bend you over, you should open your mouth so that I piss into your mouth, just like berating, berating, berating Jason, to the point that Jason actually started crying, because he just saw, like, what is about to happen within a couple of seconds, and he just felt humiliated. He was like, why are you doing this, John? I thought you were my friend. This seems to have infuriated Gacy completely. He kind of stopped stroking his penis. He put, like, his trousers back on, and he just told him to leave. And yet again, you would have thought, like, Jason would be running through that door, like, getting the hell out of that prison. But he was just frozen. He was like, this is not what I wanted. So none of them getting what they wanted out of this, Gacy just invites those guards to take a couple of pictures of the two of them, and then Jason leaves for the day. As a test of wills, Jason decides he won't go three days in a row as he intended. He will cut his visit short, but he will go in one last time. And at this point, he says, Jason, you know, do you want me to show you the rope trick that everyone talks about? The rope trick was Gacy's means of torturing his victims. After restraining them with handcuffs, he would loop a rope around their necks, slide a stick through the knot, and twist it to cut off their air. Jason demonstrated for me how Gacy placed a pen through the silver bracelet he was wearing and began to turn it. But now my hand's starting to turn away from the pain. He's not letting go. He's still twisting this bracelet around my wrist. It's starting to hurt. And now I'm thinking, oh no, I'm losing control again. Jason says Gacy's rage was building. He kept looking at the chair in that small room. It was as if Gacy was in some kind of flashback from his killing days. This guy has broken me down. I mean, it's just the rage. And how many people are in a room alone with a serial killer in a jail cell, knowing the guards are on the other side locked? 
He's standing in front of you, telling you how he's going to rape you, and he's ready to do it, and it's going to happen. By the time Jason manages to release his hand, Gacy has his pants unzipped again. He's checking himself off, and he's telling Jason yet again everything that he is going to do to him in this room on that chair, just berating him, telling him that he is nobody without him, telling him how much he has contributed to his life, and Jason is yet again stunned. And just as Gacy was about to do something, again, a guard walks in, and on this day, Ken was to come to visit as well. So, Ken walks in, and from that point on, both of them were just chatting with Gacy. Whether it was the actual visit, being stuck in a room with Gacy, who didn't hesitate for a second to just perform the same old ritual that he performed on all of the victims, on Jason, supposedly his friend, or whether it was the realization that Gacy was kind of well building a case against him, in a way. He was finding something to blackmail him with. Finally, finally, after all of this time, after all of the correspondence with all of these serial killers, Jason was done. He did go back home, and even though he was only gone for a few free days, the letters from Manson, the letters from Dahmer were all piled up. But for the first time ever, he kind of just snapped out of it. He was like, yeah, I will not treat those as a priority. I will go back to them a couple of days later, once I catch up with my family and once I catch up with Jen, his girlfriend. Once he got back to responding to letters, he kind of broke it off. I'm not sure does this mean that he just stopped writing to them or he figured out a way, one of the suggested ways throughout this video, to just leave the communication behind with Manson and Dahmer. He started corresponding with Henry Lee Lucas and another serial killer just before he went to visit Gacy, so he kind of was still corresponding with them, seeing where that goes. But his main preoccupation was getting rid of Gacy. And it didn't seem that Gacy took the message. He would again call him every Sunday, write in all of these letters, and he was really pissed off that Jason left a day early. He actually wanted for Jason to move to Illinois so that he is closer to him. And in this book, Jason writes how he couldn't really believe how deluded Gacy could be to not see how uncomfortable he was in prison, how he's not up for any of this. But what we know is that that probably wouldn't have mattered. Gacy never really cared for the consensual component in this relationship, and now he had some form of leverage over Jason. Jason knew this, so in a couple of last letters that he sent to Gacy, who by this point also had the execution date sent, so he knew that the time was running out, and also what that could mean potentially for him and, like, this potential criminal record. So, Jason did a couple of things. He was trying to establish with Gacy through these letters that the situation with his dad was getting worse and worse, kind of insinuating that he might end up on the streets and without communication with him. And also what he did, finally, yet again, Finally, he set his parents down to actually tell them the extent that this went to, and his parents realized the danger, and they hired an attorney to basically advise him of, like, what can be done. Once Jason spoke with these attorneys, he realized that he might be in a worse position than he actually thought he was. Because remember when I told you he was passing through those doors all the way to death row and was also signing some documents? Well, all of those documents kind of obliged him never to reveal any information that Gacy shared, including, like, all of the letters and everything, while Gacy never signed any documents on his end, binding him never to reveal anything of the sort. At this point, it's only a matter of time. There's only a couple of weeks until Gacy was to die by lethal injection. And as such, he's trying his best not to piss him off, but also he's ignoring all of his calls. So, what Gacy did is he would loop Ken into sort of a conference call. And then they would call Jason, but Jason just wasn't responding. But what Jason did instead, in order to compensate for the fact that, well, basically, he signed the documents, but 
Casey didn't, was he put a recording machine to automatically record all of the calls to his room. So this recording machine would pick up a call automatically. It would go off being like, leave your message after the tone and would automatically record everything said afterwards. And it just happened one evening, he's just lying in the room and listening to the conversation that Gacy and Ken are having. Gacy, I don't like people playing games with me. Hey, believe me, I know that, said Ken. I've been more than fair and generous with him, and to play with his holdout game with a phone. Come on, I have never held out on the phone. Tell me when I even didn't make the phone bill good. Yeah, John, you're right. He's had more than enough money to cover the phone bill. I've given him $475 for the phone. Yeah, I know, Ken said. I'll have to find out what's going on. Gacy then went on describing how he was to contact an old friend that he had in Las Vegas, how he was planning to pay this man to hurt Jason, and at that moment, after he had enough recorded, well, Jason picks up the phone and he says, Hello, John. I want to talk to you about this call. Ken never clicked over and my machine recorded the whole thing. To which Gacy asked, What do you mean? You know what I mean. I have it all here on the machine. How you are going to send the letters to the police. Feel free, John, to tell the police. Everyone here knows that I was just studying you for school. I let everyone know about the content of the letters before I'd even written them. The police already have a copy of them just in case you tried any bullshit like this. I bet hard copy or inside edition would be very interested in hearing about how John Wayne Gacy tried to blackmail two children, how he tried to get them to have sex together just for his amusement. Don't forget, I've got the whole damn thing on tape. And that, that was the last time that he spoke with John Wayne Gacy. Next thing Jason remembers was watching his execution as it was taking place. And as you know, this is supposed to take a matter of seconds. Tops a minute or two, and it was supposed to be this painless procedure. But this announcer, as they were actually broadcasting this execution live, well, said that there were some complications. And for 18 minutes... Nobody actually had an update here. They were just like, oh yeah, there is some complication with the chemicals, but we'll be right back. So Jason, for 18 minutes, didn't know what the hell happened. Like, did he manage to escape? Are there any complications? Is he still alive? And 18 minutes into that broadcast of the execution, they finally went back and said, he's dead. To conclude this chapter on Gacy, Ken actually spoke to Jason later and told him, I think he genuinely cared about you, at least the only way he could. He certainly ended up respecting you. He knew he'd met a match with you. He kept saying you really took him for a ride. He'd say it in anger, but I think he got a kick out of it too. A year after Jason stopped communicating with serial killers altogether, and he kind of just tried to leave this chapter of his life behind. Instead of working with perpetrators of violence, he started working with victims of it. He became a wish granter for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which involved interviewing terminally ill children to discover what they wanted, what their fantasies were, and trying to arrange maybe interviews with some of their heroes and really help them out in the last months of their life. He volunteered as a big brother and he was assigned to mentor an 11-year-old and he felt privileged to be his friend, his teacher that the boy desperately needed. And he was doing this again for multiple reasons. One was still to look at the motivations and to look at things from victim's side, just from a different angle on this occasion. And the other one was, well, because he felt as a victim too, but also as a perpetrator. Like, he couldn't tell these kids or his parents the amount of regret that he had for putting all of these people through all of that and putting himself through it, but mostly his parents. Casey, Casey won, you know? I mean, looking back, I got information from him, but he got what he wanted. He got to see me suffer, he got to see me squirm, and although he's been executed, he's always going to be a part of my mind. If I knew then what I know now, I would never have done it. Never have even written the first letter. It was too much. I mean, I was almost killed. 
Here we cut to the prologue of the book written by his professor Jeffrey Kotler. He said that Jason, during his next four years of college, learned everything he could about the psychology of criminal behavior, he volunteered to do research with his psychology professors, he studied hard during the internship with the Secret Service and Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. A few months after the book was published, the two of them were sitting side by side, interviewing Henry Lee Lucas on the death row in Huntsville, Texas. He would describe that prior to this account, prior to Jason's communications with the serial killers, and prior to a book being written up on it, we actually knew very little about this encounter between a predator and a victim, and why otherwise intelligent, capable individuals wound up being deceived and trapped. He would write how we, just like Jason, always felt drawn to the things that we fear. That is why women get obsessed with men that are behind bars. Women and men would send prisoners naked pictures of themselves. This is why so many movies and books have been written about them. Just like Jason did, people want to reach into the darkness without fully understanding the psychological consequences. So the question remains... Why did he do it? What were the motives that he has said himself throughout this book? One of them, yes, was partially for his studies, for his project, in order to give him an edge to go work for the FBI. Jason, throughout these chapters, has said that when he was totally honest with himself, he realized part of the reason why he reached out to serial killers in the first place was that he admired them. Not the crimes, but the nerve and the follow-through on those. He admired the aspect where they would be taunting those who would try to control them. But only later, after it was all over, he both realized what the truth was, but he also witnessed it himself. And that is that this exertion of control by serial killers was weakness masquerading as strength. To loop this back into a full circle, we meet Jason yet again at that speech, where he was addressing his fellow classmates, telling them what he dedicated his freshman year to. After listening to his speech, his professor concluded that if his experience taught us anything, it is that pretending affinity with perpetrators of evil will over time wreak dire consequences on the psyche. In a very real sense, Jason Moss was for John Wayne Gacy, Richard Ramirez, Henry Lee Lucas, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Charles Manson, their last victim. This book was published in 1999, and 17 years later, on June the 6th, 2006, Jason Moss died of self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. His suicide date, 666, has been the subject of some speculation. He left behind his wife Charlotte and the criminal defense practice that he has started. And we truly don't know the cause behind his suicide, just as well as we don't know the extent of his mental state for the past 17 years. In the same way that he managed to hide from his parents what he did during his freshman year, he managed to hide what he was going through from the whole world. And as much as I'd like to sit here and tell you that it all paid off in the end, that the risk was worth the reward, here I can personally only see risk and no reward, no substantial justification for any of this to have happened. That is the story about Jason Moss, the last victim. Let me know what you personally think about this case. I think it is a true showcase of what Jeffrey Kotler said in the end, and that is that, like, any affinity towards serial killers, towards the morbid, that doesn't really have a deadline. It's not like a research for a project that has the start and the end date will lend to the consequences to your own mental health, will affect your own psyche. If you think about it, there is a reason why journalists, FBI agents, people in law enforcement, anybody really dealing with any form of killers, any form of perpetrators, do it with the deadline. They do it as their project, they do it while they're researching the case, and then that chapter gets closed and they move on. 
As I mentioned, when I went into reading this book, I kind of felt like, okay, this is stone deaf. Like, how can you call yourself your last victim just on the basis of you communicating with the serial killers? Like, there are people that have actually suffered in this man's hands. But then, as you read it, one thing that was annoying to me personally is the same exact thing that I find annoying when editing my own videos. So, I have a feeling I have a right to say it. And that is that sometimes I'm either too erratic or like too passionate and I feel like I need to comment, I need to insert myself into the story. And this just doesn't make the story flow as smoothly as it would. But then when you look at this from his own perspective, this man was so deep in that he couldn't take himself out of the story. He could not see it from a third perspective. And when thinking about it from that perspective, I don't think that the title of it is Tone Death at all. I only wish we knew more about what was going on through his head that 17 years later, he just couldn't live with himself any longer. I told you there's a shocker in the end, and boy, that did shock me when I first heard about this story. So let me know what you think about this one in the comments. Make sure you don't forget to like and subscribe to this video if you want more stories like this, if you want me to read more true crime books and immerse myself into these deep stories. And well, if we learned anything from this one, it is to stay away from the affinity towards serial killers in any way, shape or form, to never write letters to them, if the pattern of this month has taught us anything, that is to never even think about writing a letter to them, because you just never know. They will outsmart you, because they're doing the same thing to hundreds of people, while you're practicing on only one person. And that one person not only masterminded series of murders that landed them in that prison in the first place, but are also manipulating people from there. But now I have to go edit this beauty that is gonna last for like three hours and then I shall be seeing you guys next week. Bye! 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 Bye.